you, Lord, for your faithfulness to each one of us, Father. We thank you, Lord, that as we continue to grow in our relationship with you, Father, with your Son, Jesus, with your Holy Spirit, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you show yourself faithful in so many ways. And so, Lord, I pray even now as we open up your word, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us, Father, to understand what you would want to speak, that you would speak to each one of our hearts, Father. You'd bring life to your word. Your word would come alive to us, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. This morning, I want to speak about faith. The choice is ours. The choice is ours. And I want to start off, the text will be, Isaiah chapter 7, starting at verse 1. Isaiah chapter 7, starting at verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramali, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim, so his heart and the hearts of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. The wonderful messianic prophecy found in Isaiah 7 is prefaced with this historical context into which it was given. So there's going to be a, it's a beautiful messianic prophecy, but before then, it gives us the historical context of that prophetic word. Ahaz, the king of Judah, was an ungodly and unfaithful king who worshipped false pagan gods and ruled unrighteously. Ahaz's unrighteousness resulted in God withdrawing his protection. The enemies of Judah, Syria, and the northern kingdom of Israel attacked with the intention of deposing Ahaz and destroying Judah. So we see the context is the king of Judah, even though he was unfaithful, he was still, God still had a purpose for Judah. And in the midst of this now, they are about to be, these two nations are coming to try to destroy Judah and to depose the king. So his heart and the hearts of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. The report that Syria and Ephraim were coming against Judah caused Ahaz and all the people of Judah to tremble with fear, shaking like a leaf. That's what it literally says. It, they were shaking like leaves. But God had a redemptive purpose for allowing this attack to happen. He wanted to turn the hearts of Ahaz and Judah back to himself. In other words, God had a purpose in allowing Syria and Ephraim to come against Judah. Because even though Judah and, and Ahaz were ungodly, God wanted to bring a change of heart. He wanted to bring redemption. He wanted to be, bring repentance. Then verse 3, it continues on. Then the Lord said to Isaiah... Go now to meet Ahaz, you and Sher Sherjazub, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to Fuller's Field. And say to him, take heed and be quiet. Do not fear, be not fainted, faint-hearted, for these two stubs of smoke in brand, firebrands for the fierce anger of resident Syria and the son of Ramallah. The Lord sent Isaiah and his son to meet Ahaz with an important message. Isaiah's name in the Hebrew is Yeshea, and it means salvation of the Lord or the Lord saves. That's what Isaiah means, the Lord saves. And it's closely linked with another name, Yeshua, which means salvation. That's the name of Joshua or Jesus. So Isaiah name means the Lord saves. But Isaiah's son, his name is Shir Jashub, and it means a remnant shall return. And that's an ominous warning. Only a remnant will return. Isaiah and his son stood before King Ahaz as a prophetic analogy with a message from the Lord and a choice that Ahaz must make. Either the Lord will save or only a remnant will be left. So those two men stood there it was a, a prophetic analogy saying, today, Ahaz, you have a choice. Either God will save or only a remnant will be left. The message the Lord 
had for Ahaz was meant to comfort and strengthen him and Judah. What was the message? Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted for these two stubs of smoking firebrands. You know, there's this ungodly king, this king that was supposed to be ruling over God's people, but both him and God's people had gone astray. But what was the word in the midst of this calamity, in the midst of this terrible fear that they were comprised, their lives were at stake. What did God say to them? He spoke words of comfort. He says, take heed, be quiet, don't be afraid, don't be faint-hearted. What wonderful words of grace. What a display of God's grace and mercy and long-suffering as he reached out to Ahaz and to Judah. God des describes the two great armies who, ha who came to destroy Judah as nothing more than a little bit of smoke. That's what he says. So don't be afraid of these two firebrands of smoke. You know what God was saying? They're no problem for me. Even though you see them as two giant armies, to me, they're just a little bit of smoke. But what did he say? He said, but you know, he said, but keep your eyes on me because you know one thing about smoke? It can't burn you, but it can get in your eyes. And then you can't see. So he says, take heed and be quiet and don't be faint-hearted because even though the smoke can't burn you, but if you keep your eyes on it, it will blind you. Verse five. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Amal have plotted evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves and set a king over them, the son of Tabal. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken so that it will not be a people. God gave a wonderful promise concerning the impending plot that Syria and Ephraim devised against Judah and King Ahaz. What was his promise? It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. Within 65 years, Ephraim will no longer be a nation, and Syria will no longer be a threat. What a wonderful promise, and what wonderful words of comfort from the Lord God of Israel to an unfaithful king and to a black backslidden nation. Truly God's mercy and loving kindness extends to us even in the midst of our failures. Maybe there's people here who are believers who put their faith in Christ, but you failed. You've backslidden. You haven't been walking with God. But God is here saying, I'm extending mercy. I want to restore you. I'm here not to push you away. I'm not here to destroy you. I'm here in the midst of your backsliddenness. I'm here in the midst of your failures and I'm extending mercy and saying, trust me now and I will bring you out of your calamity. I will bring you out of your failures. Verse nine. The head of Ephraim is Samaria and the head of Samaria is Ramali's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. There is only one condition for this promise of Judah's deliverance to become a reality. They needed to put their faith in the Lord and completely trust him. That was the only condition. He didn't say, I'm expecting you to do great things. I'm not expecting you to do this and that. He says, I want you to trust me. I want you to trust me. And I will then fulfill my promises. Just simply believe and trust God. Such a simple request for God to ask of Ahaz and wonderful promises would be manifest. Isn't that wonderful? Just trust God. But when we're back sudden, that's the hardest thing for us to do. But God says, I want you to learn to trust me again. If you failed, if your life's a mess, God says, I want you to trust me and I will then bring about my salvation and my restoration. The absolute necessity of having total confidence in God for Ahaz and Judah to receive this deliverance is underlined by Isaiah's statement. And I want to read it in a couple different translations. If you are not firm in your faith, you will not be firm at all. 
That's the English Standard Version. Or the New American Standard. If you will not believe, you shall surely not last. In other words, it doesn't matter what mess you're in. God says, I'll get you out of it. But if you're not trusting me, then you will not be firm and you will not be faithful. And you will not see the fulfillment of God's purposes for your life. Verse 10 and 11. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. The Lord wanted to help Ahaz to fulfill this simple requirement to fully trust him. And what was that? What did God say? The Lord said, ask for any sign or miracle, no matter how great and wonderful, and I'll do it so you'll be able to truly believe. God is saying, I know you're struggling with unbelief. So you know something? I'm going to say, ask me any sign, any miracle, and I'll do it. So then you can really trust that I'm speaking and can really trust that I'm going to be faithful. Verse 12. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Ahaz's response, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord, sounds so pious and virtuous. But in reality, it was the most rebellious and defiant answer he could have given. Sounds good. Oh, no, I don't want to test God. But it was the most rebellious and defiant answer he could have given. Verse 13, the next verse. Then he said, that's Isaiah. Hear now, O house of Israel. Is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you now weary my God also? Will you weary my God also? Isaiah's response to Asa's answer really exposes the wickedness and rebellion in Asa's heart. When he said, I will not test God, I will not, sounds so good. But Asa said, uh, Isaiah said to Asa, you know, you've wearied men, but now will you weary God? Ahaz didn't really want to believe God and put his faith in him. He wanted to continue to serve his idols and his fleshly desires. He didn't want a sign because if he had a sign, he would have to acknowledge the reality of God and he would then have to make a choice between his idols and his fornication and his evil and God. So he goes, no, I don't want a sign. You ever had it where you witness the people and, and it gets a bit too warm? They go, it's, it's okay, I don't want to talk about it anymore. I, I don't, I don't, it's okay. I had one time, my brother, I was, I, when I was a young young Christian, my brother brought somebody over to our home from high school, and uh, we just sat down and started talking about the Lord. I don't know what happened, but he ran out of the house after about a half hour. <laughs> and you know what he said to my brother? I think it's true, but I don't want to know it. <laughs> and that was Ahaz. I don't want to test God. I don't want to trust God. I don't want to know if God's faithful. I don't even want to know if God is there. Ahaz didn't want to see a miracle because then he would have had to face the fact that the God of Israel is true and, and the living God and there is no other. Now, Gideon is an example of someone who God called to deliver Israel from the Midianites. And so when he spoke to, when God spoke to Gideon, and Gideon says, who am I? I'm, I'm just, I'm a nobody in Israel. And my family in, in Israel is a nobody too. And he says, oh mighty man of faith, God is going to use you to deliver Israel. So when he heard that, he says, well, can I have a sign? He says, I'm going to take a, a fleece and put it on the ground at night. Piece of wool. And, and, and in the morning... Let the ground be dry. Let there be no dew on the ground, but let the fleece be wet. So Gideon the next morning gets up and he goes over the fleeces and the ground is dry and he takes that fleece and he wrings out a whole bunch of water. So you know what Gideon does next? Verse Judges 6.39, And Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me, but let me just speak once more. Let me test, I pray, just one more with, one more with the fleece. But la now let it be dry only on the fleece, and let all the ground be wet with dew. 
You know what God did? He did it. God did it. But then, Gideon has all these men ready to fight. But I think about 10,000 was there or something? There's a lot of men. And you know what God says to Gideon? Too many. Gideon goes, too what? <laughs> too many. So he pars it down, and some leave. Still too many. Then he gets more men gone till he has 300 men. 300 men with trumpets and with lamps and clay pots. 300 men to fight an army and not a sword. And you know what happens? In Judges chapter 7, verse 9, it happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they shall say. And afterward, your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the army, armed men who were in the camp. So he snuck in to the Midian camp because God told them to. And he says, listen to what you're going to hear. And so he's there eavesdropping. And two of the Midianites are talking. And one says, you know, I had a dream. And they go, what was the dream? And he tells them the dream. The interpretation is the dream is that this is nothing else than Gideon and his army. He's going to come and he's going to conquer all of us. And then Gideon was strengthened his faith and went back. In other words, Gideon asked for a sign. He asked for a second sign. And God said, I see you're still a little bit shaky here. So you know something? I'm going to give you a third sign. Now, it's different. See, when, we, when Gideon was asking for a sign, he wasn't saying, give me a sign that I'll know you're faithful. He was saying, give me a sign that I know you're speaking. That's different. If, if we're wicked, we're saying, God, I'm not sure you're faithful. You prove that. That's a wicked heart. But we're saying, God, I know you're faithful. I just want to make sure that it is you speaking, and I want to make sure I'm understanding. You know, you want to make sure you're getting the right instructions. Another example is Hezekiah. Hezekiah was terminally ill. He was dying and he called up to God. And so Isaiah, the Lord says to, to Isaiah, go back. Talk to Hezekiah and says, You're gonna, he's going to be healed. and He's going to get another, I think, 15 years. So Isaiah said, you know, the Lord has told me that he's going to heal you and you have another 15 years and he's going to give you a sign. And the sign is either the sundial, the sun will move forward 10 degrees or back 10 degrees. You know what Isaiah's answer was? It's easier for the sundial, for the sun to move forward 10 degrees than go backward 10 degrees. So I choose to say, have God move it back 10 degrees. Now, why was he saying that? He said he wanted to be so confident that it was God speaking that no matter what he was facing, he says, I know the word that God has spoken. And I'm sure of it. The reason God gave those signs is because the hearts of both Gideon and Hezekiah were hearts that trusted God and they wanted to be believed and they wanted to obey. Say, so God, strengthen my faith that I'll know this is you who is speaking so I will be able to believe that I will be established and I will be able to fulfill your will. That's the difference. An unbelieving nation says, Give me a sign to prove that God is there and that he's faithful. Now I want to know if, if there really is a God and if he's really faithful. See the difference? One is an act of unbelief. The other is a desire to be faithful. In like fashion, God wants to prove himself faithful to us. But we must be willing to seek, ask, and knock and take note of his wonderful faithfulness to each of us. In other words, Ahaz didn't want to ask. I'm not going to ask for a sign. But God is saying, ask, seek me, knock. I'll reveal myself. I'll answer you. I'll open those doors. And what we need to do is afterwards, we need to take note of when he does those things. You know, I keep a, a spiritual diary I have a, you know, just things that God does, prophetic words he speaks or miracles he does. And I've got like close to 300 pages now, typewritten pages over the last 20 years. And what is it? I take note. You know, sometimes where somebody's praying for something and God answers 
And either they, in the midst of their need, they're seeking God, but once the, the need has been met, they forget that, wow, God answered that. Or initially, they go, that was wonderful, but then later on, well, maybe that was a coincidence. But God says, I want you to seek me and I will prove that I'm faithful. I will prove that I can do miracles. I will prove that when you cry out to me, when you call to me, I do answer you. If we never invest time with God in prayer and walk with him, we'll never grow in our faith to see his faithfulness manifest in our lives. We'll remain skeptics regarding the power and the miracles of God. For God to prove himself faithful, we need to be taking risks. We need to step out in faith. I was witnessing to a, a Jewish fellow a few days ago, and he said to me, and you know, we're talking about, about the reality of God, and he says, well, you know, he says, you don't, you're not convincing me. And I said, well, the reason that when you read the Bible, you're not convinced is because you don't really believe miracles happen. He goes, that's probably right. In fact, you know, I heard a debate between a, an atheist and a Christian, and these are smart guys. They know all sorts of fancy words and stuff like that that I don't know. But anyways, as they're debating, you know, they were debating about if Christ was really resurrected. And so they both, of course, historically, we know that Jesus existed. Even secular historians will say, yes, there was a man named Jesus that lived at that time. And even looking at the evidence, they can even verify that, yeah, something happened and, and there was an empty tomb. That's, that's quite likely from the records. But the difference is, was he resurrected? And so there's many different theories why there's an empty tomb. Right? There's many different theories why there's an empty tomb. Some people say, well, maybe uh, the, the, his disciples came at night and stole him. Well, that's pretty tough when you have those soldiers there, right? And if somebody touches that body, they're dead. They're going to make sure that nobody gets near the stone, right? For sure. So they have all these, maybe, maybe he, he was not really dead, but he, he just was uh, swooned, right? And, and then when he was laid on the cold stone, he finally revived and walked out, and the soldiers got scared and ran away. You know, and, and it did all different stories, you know, all different stories. And this one atheist said this. He said, you know, he can't prove that Jesus wasn't resurrected. All he knows is there's an empty tomb. But he said, of all the possibilities, a miracle that a man could be raised from the dead is the least likely. A miracle is the least likely thing that could ever happen. So any other explanation is more likely than that explanation. Isn't that their logic? In other words, we know that miracles are the least likely because he says, I've never seen one. So any other explanation is more likely than that explanation. But the problem is that he hasn't seen miracles, but we have. So when I read the Bible, I go, it's no problem. And I remember sharing a couple days ago with this man about, remember uh, Claire Reed? How many people remember Claire? And she was about 68 at the time. She was coming to our Bible study. She had emphysema, very extreme emphysema. I mean, she was on oxygen 24 seven, sitting, sitting in the chair, listening to me. She was breathing hard, I can understand that. I mean, <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> but, but even sitting, she was gasping for breath. They said the emphysema, emphysema wasn't gonna kill her directly. She was gonna have a heart failure. Remember that, she would, she would just have this oxygen tank and she'd be barely being able to sit and breathe. And so we prayed for her every Monday night. Remember that, Jim, Jeannie? Were you there, Don? Yes, you remember that too. For six months, we prayed for her every Monday night after the, after the meeting. And then one night, as we're praying for her, all of a sudden, the presence of God came upon her. Anyways, I saw her a couple weeks later. She was in the Monday night meeting, and I was saying, uh, Clara, where's your oxygen tank? She goes, oh, I di didn't I tell you? Two weeks ago, God healed me. She, but she didn't take the oxygen off. She went to the doctors. The do doctors did the blood gas work. Her blood gases were perfect. I'll tell you how healed she was. A few weeks later, on a Monday night, it was raining. And remember, at my home, we had about 60 to 80 people in my home. So parking, we had pe people, cars, cars parked up and down the street, like, like for about, it looked like two miles, right? You know what I mean? People are thinking, what's going on here? And then there's a park about a, a half a block down on the other side of the street. So she parked there. It was raining. 
She ran across the street, across my lawn, into the house, and she wasn't breathing hard. Now, of course, she did pass away 15 years later, and not from emphysema, and I did her funeral. But she was totally healed completely, and it didn't return. Now, when I, and, and so there's a number of people here that were here to testify to that, right? But when I told that man, he had, one, he had two choices, either to believe that I was a liar or there's a God. There wasn't a third possibility there. But so the atheists, they said, they, when they say, what about miracles? No, there's no such thing. I said, do you want to have proof? No, we don't want to waste our time looking into that. They're like Ahaz. We don't want a sign because we don't want to believe. Verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall call his name Emmanuel. Since Ahaz refused to ask for a sign from God, Isaiah said the Lord himself would choose a sign proving that he would deliver his people. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. This verse is one of the most marvelous messianic prophecies found in the Bible. But it is also one of the most problematic ones for non-believers. Why? The Hebrew word for virgin used in the Hebrew is Alma, and it can mean virgin, but it also can mean a young woman of marriageable age or a newly, med, newly wed woman. So this word, the, Greek, the Hebrew word there could mean virgin, but it can also mean a young woman or a young woman who's just newly married. Isaiah could easily have used another Hebrew word for virgin, which would have meant specifically virgin and would have eliminated any ambiguity, but he didn't. He chose a word that had two meanings. He could have chosen another Hebrew word that would have clearly only have meant virgin. But God has a purpose in his choice of the Hebrew word Alma. Matthew 1.23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Matthew clearly quotes from Isaiah 7.14 using the Greek word for virgin and citing it as a messianic prophecy fulfilled in the birth of Jesus. Now, Jewish scholars who do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, promised Messiah, point to Matthew's quote in Isaiah as an improper translation. That's what they say, it's an improper translation. It is interesting and very significant to note that the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which was completed by Jewish scholars in the second century BC, having no inclination or Christian influence since Jesus had not yet been born, chose to translate the Hebrew word Alma as virgin in the Greek. 200 years before Christ's birth, the Hebrew scholars, the Jewish scholars, translating the Old Testament into Greek, translated this saying, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a child. The Jewish scholars who translated the Septuagint clearly understood this verse to be a messianic prophecy, even though the concept of the virgin birth, birth probably eluded them as to what it actually meant and how it would become a reality. It was not part of Jewish theology that virgins have children. That's not part of Jewish theology. But they looked at it and they understood that there is something miraculous. They didn't understand what it meant. They didn't understand how it would happen but they were faithful and they translated Isaiah 7:14 as behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son another another piece of this prophetic puzzle is found in the parameters that Ahaz sign encompassed what did god say ask for a sign for yourself from god the lord god ask it either in the depths or the height above he says, you know something? He said, now this parameter is very important to understand another piece of the puzzle. Since Ahaz failed to ask for a sign, God himself was going to choose the sign of his deliverance, and his sign would incorporate everything from the depths below to the heights above. 
If the sign was simply a young woman giving birth to a child, even though the gift of life is miraculous, it does not encompass the immensity of the miracle that God envisioned to instill unshakable faith. In other words, God says, I want to give you such a sign that your faith will be unshakable. So a woman's going to have a baby. Well, that's not that unshakable. The great miraculous sign that would signify that God would deliver his people from their sins was the virgin birth of the Son of God. Matthew 121. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 121 repeats the promise offered to King Asa, which he rejected. But all those who hear and believe the sign will be established. The sign that he rejected, we have received and we have been established in our faith in Christ. So how is Jesus Christ's birth a sign that is deep as the depths and as high as, his he- as, high as the heavens? Well, John 16, 28. John 16, 28. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. And again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, left the heights of heaven and was born as a son of man on the earth. He was crucified. He went to the depths of hell for us. And, after, and the third day, he was raised from the dead and he sits at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven. So what's the sign? The Son of God came from the throne of heaven to the earth, to the depths of hell, and back to heaven again. A sign as high as heaven, as deep as hell. We see how Christ's marvelous virgin birth beautifully fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah 714. But that still does not explain why did God use the Hebrew word Alma, which can be translated as virgin or young woman. What I've shared so far still does not address that question. Another characteristic of many biblical prophecies is that they possess both an immediate fulfillment and also a far off or an ultimate fulfillment. The ultimate fulfillment was the birth of Christ, but there was also the immediate needed need facing Esau, Ahaz, and Judah with the invasion of the armies of Ephraim and Syria. And continuing on, verses 15 and 16, Courage and honey shall eat, that he may know how to refuse evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. God was saying that a child is going to be born and before the child can eat curds or honey, in other words, before the child is weaned from his mother, the king of Ephraim and Syria would be removed. So in other words, from the time that a child will be born till the child's weaned, before the child is weaned, those two kings will be deposed. And it says, before the child will know between good and evil, and it's interesting, it says, and before it can eat curds and honey. What is curds? It's soured milk. What is honey? It's sweet. Before the child will know the difference between sweet and sour, between good and evil, those two kings will be removed. And what do we do? We see the fulfillment in the next chapter. Chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. This is Isaiah speaking. Then I went to the prophetess, that's his wife, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, call his name. Now this is a tough one. Mare Shalal Hashbaz. Could you imagine calling, calling him for supper? It'd be cold by the time you got the name out. <laughs> for before the child shall know to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before the king of Assyria. Right? He said, a child will be born. And what is the name that Isaiah gave that son? We see in Isaiah 8, 3 and 4, the first or the immediate fulfillment of of Isaiah 7:14, Isaiah's wife bore a son whose name means speed the spoil or hasten the prey, signifying how quickly the removal of Judah's enemies, Ephraim and Syria, would take place. In other words, quick to the spoil, quick to the booty. In other words, the plunder is coming and it's going to happen quickly and God's going to remove those two nations, those two kings that are threatening Judah. But because Ahaz did not want a miraculous sign. No miraculous sign would be given to him. Remember, he didn't want a sign to believe, right? So the sign given to him was just a child being born. But for us to believe, the sign that is given is a virgin conceives the Son of God. 
It's interesting that his name will be called Emmanuel. Well, Emmanuel in the Hebrew can be translated two different ways. One is, Emmanuel means God is with us. And that describes the immediate problem when Israel faced those two enemies and God was saying, I'm with you now. But also Emmanuel could be translated, with us is God. And that's when Christ was born. With us is God. So you see two fulfillments, two meanings. Therefore, we see that Isaiah's prophecy encompassed two situations that required deliverance. One from the immediate enemies of Judah, but also ultimate, the ultimate enemy, which is our sins. One was a natural, a married woman bearing a son, and one was a virgin bearing the Son of God. However, there's a third reason that the prophecy of Isaiah 7.14 contains an apparent ambiguity. There's a third reason why there is an ambiguity. God gives each person the freedom to choose to either to find faith in Christ or to reject faith in Christ. A, a central aspect of God's character is that he does not force us to have a relationship with him. He gives us the choice. He gives us the choice. And God allows ambiguity for us to say, will we seek him or will we not seek him? Will we seek him or will we not seek him? Isaiah 45, 15. Isaiah 45, 15. Truly you are God who hide yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. God is described the God who hides himself. If God overwhelmed us with his presence and proof of himself, then we would have had no choice but to believe in him. But he is the God who hides himself and he delights to reveal himself to those who are willing to seek him. God is saying, I'm here. If you seek me, you will find me. God spoke to King Ahaz through the prophet Isaiah and offered to him any sign as high as the heavens or as deep as hell. But Ahaz refused and chose to stay in unbelief. Ahaz wanted to keep God obscure. He wanted to keep God obscure. And a lot of times people say, well, they like to talk about God a little bit, but in reality, they don't want to get deep into it. They don't want to really seek God. They don't want to really find out if there really is a God. They're more interested in the, in the just the kind of philosophical. Famed atheist Richard Dawkins was once asked, what if after you died, you ran into God, what would you say? Dawkins' reply was, why did you go to such lengths to hide yourself? I think a good response would be, why didn't you ever look for me, and why didn't you ever want to consider the things I already showed you? Atheists don't want to see God. They want the ambiguities of life to remain. And so God writes the word of God, the Bible. It's such a wonderful, wonderful truth. It is the truth of God's word, but it's filled with ambiguities. But for those who seek God, those things are unlocked and they become crystal clear. Amen. I remember when I was first a believer and I was reading through the Bible the very first time and I, I was sort of had all these questions. What about this and what about that and how can that? But over the years as I've been seeking God and praying, many of those things have become clear and I go, wow, that is so perfectly written. What looks like something that is a mistake or something that looks like it's contradictory really fits together. Just like why God chose to use the word Alma instead of the Hebrew word that could mean specifically virgin. Because first of all, he had two prophecies to fulfill, two purposes, but also to pro provide ambiguity so those who don't want to believe don't have to, but those who seek him will find the answer. God provides ambiguities and subtleties through his word, through creation, and even in our daily experiences so we can find him if we choose to seek him. And at the same time, he does not force himself on anyone. Subtleties and ambiguities allow room for unbelief, but also allow room for faith to grow. Because if you have it in front of you, you don't have to believe. But God allows ambiguities for the unbelievers not to believe, but for the believers to go past what they don't understand to say, I trust you anyways. God is obscured to those who are unbelieving, but believers can learn to have faith in God and trust him in spite of circumstances or because of circumstances. Because God is faithful. 
You know, I do a, a presentation on creation evolution, and I've been doing it for about 20, 23 years now. And, uh, and one thing when you talk to atheists or evolutionists, you know one of the things that really stumble them, why they think life came from nothing? And why they think life can go from simple to complex? No one understands how non-life can become life. No one understands how simple life can be complex life. But they're convinced of it. You know why they're so convinced of it? Because God created so much life, so much variety of life. Life is so overwhelmingly abundant on this earth that anywhere you look, there is life. Do you know in the depths of the oceans, miles down, there's life. There is so much life. You know, everywhere there's life. You lift up a rock, there's life. You, you know something? It costs a fortune in the medical system because life is so prolific. Because they spend so much money cleaning up a room for an operation so there's no bacteria, so there's no viruses. They spend so much money and within a short period of time they're there again. You can't stop it. Life's everywhere. It's everywhere. So they go, it, it must be spontaneous because it's everywhere. It must be easy for it to develop because it's everywhere. And since it's so varied, it must develop quickly in all sorts of forms because it's so varied. In other words, the ambiguity is this. Because of God's superabundant creativity and design and abundance of life, to the unbeliever, it's, it's an it's a ambiguity, a puzzle that points to it must be spontaneous. But to us who have faith, we see the creativity of God and go, our God is awesome. And his creation is such a reflection of his creativity and his abundance. Anyways, that was a bit of fun, but not really about the message. But <laughs> As we spend time in his word and prayer and abiding with him throughout the day, the reality of his presence and power becomes more and more evident to us. A backslidden Christian is one who spends less time with God, and God becomes less relevant and less connected. We become less connected. Hallelujah. But for us, as we walk with God and we spend every day walking with God, not just a prayer time in the morning, but learning to abide with the Lord, to walk with God, to, to be in communication with him throughout the day, all of a sudden, he becomes more and more real to us. And we see God in everything. We see his hand in everything because his hand is in everything and because he hears us. King Asa regrettably chose not to seek to believe in God. He chose to cling to his idols and his unbelief. King Asa, instead of trusting in God to vanquish Ephraim and Syria, took events into his own hands and desecrated and pillaged the temple of God in Jerusalem. He gave the golden treasures to the king of Assyria so he would attack Ephraim and Syria and deliver Judah from them. So Ahaz said, I don't want to believe in God. I don't want to trust God, so I'm going to do it my way. He desecrated the temple of God in Jerusalem, took the treasures, the gold, and gave it to the king of Assyria. Ahaz chose not to trust God to vanquish his enemies, and by doing it himself, he brought terrible suffering upon himself and Judah. Ahaz resolved an immediate problem, but he created a bigger problem that he couldn't resolve. Verse 17. And the Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house, days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. What is God saying here? He's saying, I know what you're going to do. I know you're not going to trust me. I know you refuse to believe my sign. So what's going to happen is you're going to go to Assyria. They're going to help you initially, but later they're coming down and they're going to oppress you and do more damage than Ephraim and, and Syria. Initially, his plan seemed to work. But ultimately, Assyria, whom he had trusted, became the one who oppressed him and brought destruction on Judah. Ahaz did not believe God's word with the result that he was not established and his life ended in disgrace. His life ended in disgrace. Isaiah 7. So we look at, we look at this here. And we see now a, a gospel message in the book of Isaiah. And I'll just give you a quick one. Isaiah 7 prophesies about the incarnation of Christ, his humanity. A virgin will bear forth a child. Isaiah 9 prophesies about the attributes of Christ, his divinity. 
I'll just read a few verses from Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In other words, Isaiah 9 speaks about the divinity of Christ. Isaiah 11 prophesies about the ministry of Christ. And Isaiah 53 prophesies about the sacrifice of Christ, his suffering, death, burial, and resurrection. So we can see the gospel message. Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 53. Awesome, isn't it? But for those who have unbelief, it's obscure and ambiguous. But for us, who put our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it becomes clear and it becomes marvelous. And I'd like to close with this verse. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. God will reveal himself to those who seek him and call upon him. Isn't that wonderful? It doesn't matter where you've gone. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts and the wicked forsake his ways and let him return to the Lord and God will have mercy and God will abundantly pardon and God will establish. It doesn't matter where we're at. You know, today, I, I don't know where you're at. I just know a few of you. Some of you have never, never received Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe you've gone to church. Maybe you've read the Bible a little bit. But you've never come and had an encounter with Christ. And this morning is an opportunity to put your faith in Christ. Asa chose not to put his faith in God. And his life ended in this dishonor and shame. But God calls us to put our faith in him to trust him. So if you have never received Christ, you have an opportunity this morning to put your faith, to know that you're a sinner, to know that you failed, but to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. The son of God came on the earth. He lived the perfect life we couldn't have lived. And he died on the cross for our sins. And he went to hell for our sins. And he was raised from the dead the third day. And he's at the right hand of the father. And if we'll say, God, I am a sinner and I need you. And I believe what Jesus has done. Forgive me. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. That is all that God says. Believe and you will be established. Believe and you will be established. There's others here that are believers that maybe haven't been walking with God the way they should have. But God here is also extending his mercy saying, well, I'm here to abundantly pardon, to defeat the enemies that you brought upon your own life and to give you victory and glory. And also there are people that are walking with God and we can give thanks to God and ask God, help me to be more faithful. Help me to trust you more. I want to have a more fruitful life. You know, when I was praying about this message, I didn't know what the message was. Friday night, I still had nothing, which is not unusual. And I was saying, Lord, it's getting pretty close to Saturday night, you know. And so I was praying and, and uh, we we're all praying together and, and uh, about five or six of us, or 10 of us, I should say. And as we're praying, this verse came to me. Um, in Isaiah. And I thought, oh, a choice to believe or not to believe. A choice to be established or a choice not to be established. Anyways, after we finished praying, Jeannie said, I, I got a vision, but I don't know what it meant. And I, I said, what's the vision? So he said, well, I saw a coin. One, ha one side of the coin was tarnished copper and the other side was silver. And it was spinning. And then the copper side fell down and the silver side went face up. And then she saw a crown but it was sitting at like a, a wheel, like a tire would be on its side, and it was about to roll away. But then she saw somebody take hands and take that crown and put it on somebody's head. And then take that coin and put it in the crown and it became a diamond. And then she looked at me and says, I don't know what it means. And I looked at her and said, either do I. So I said, let's pray. And as we prayed, all of a sudden, within a minute or so, this thought came to me. And this is the thought. 
copper in the Bible speaks about judgment. Think of the brass altar, the copper altar, the copper labor. It speaks about judgment. And it's tarnished. But silver speaks about redemption. And it's a coin spinning saying the choice is ours. Will we choose redemption or will we choose judgment? But when we choose redemption, this copper is hidden and the redemption becomes manifest. And the crown, what does the crown represent? To be an overcomer. It's about to get away from you. You're about to lose it. But when we choose redemption, he takes that crown and he puts it on your head so you can overcome. And he takes that coin and it becomes a diamond. It becomes the glory of God. God redeeming you and his glory is seen through your life. And this morning we have that opportunity. The choice is ours. The choice to believe or the choice not to believe. The choice to trust or the choice to continue to do things in our own unbelief and self-effort.